armed merchant ships in the First and Second World Wars were a legacy of the Age of Sail. Back then, almost every ship carried armament of some kind, largely to see off pirates, and in some cases, the size of the ship was enough for them to occasionally be pressed into service as a basic form of warship, with the difference between a merchant ship equipped for war and an actual purpose-designed warship growing as time progressed. For example, during the 13th to 15th centuries, the difference between most ships at war and most reasonable sized merchant ships in peacetime was relatively minimal, beyond some building up of the fore and after castles. In the 16th and 17th centuries, as cannon were introduced, merchant ships generally became less capable than the larger warships, but they were still capable of tangling with smaller and mid-sized warships, albeit somewhat inefficiently. By the 18th century and onwards, the difference in capability was widening fast, and by the time steam, armour, and later fire control systems came into play, the merchant vessel was massively inferior to the warship, with the sole exception of small commerce protection or third-class cruisers whose lack of armour, small guns, and diminutive size might allow a particularly large merchantman that had its own guns something of a fighting chance. However, it wasn't just warships that navies had to think about. The use of armed merchants to raid enemy shipping was a long-established practice, and now, especially with the differentiation in appearance that the Age of Steam had brought about, a merchant with hidden guns was vastly easier to disguise and blend into a general shipping stream as compared to the now rather more obvious forms of warships. Additionally, merchantmen were generally designed for very long distance, low speed, and relatively efficient cruising with a minimal crew, at least as far as cargo ships were concerned, whereas warships, and passenger liners for that matter, tended to need a lot more crew and tended to have far higher tolerance engines that were designed for speed and thus could not stay out at sea quite as long especially if raiding merchantmen used their cargo space to load up on additional supplies and fuel, thus further extending their range. And last of all, there was the simple case that the vastly increasing costs of warships meant that the sheer numbers that you'd need to meaningfully conduct a blockade or a patrol pattern across an entire ocean were unaffordable if you tried to sling that alongside a battle fleet, even in the biggest navies and so a reasonably swift merchant vessel with a few guns was thought to be a useful auxiliary for dealing with enemy blockade runners and the occasional raiding merchantmen that might show up. In response to all this, there were also moves to provide most merchants in wartime with at least a minimal armament, at first to scare off small raiders, and then to provide some defence against surface submarines, and by World War II to also provide a small amount of protection from air attack. Thus, whilst the days of conning a powerful enemy squadron into believing that you had a small battle fleet by means of clever manoeuvres and some quick repainting on a bunch of East Indiamen had long passed, both world wars would see two primary types of armed merchant vessels sailing the seas, the armed merchant cruiser and the armed merchant raider, which were pretty much the same thing, only working for opposite sides. These vessels were generally of moderate to large size and would carry a battery comparable with a small light cruiser of the period, albeit with guns scattered around the ship, also tending to use older or obsolete weapons that weren't of much use on mainline warships, and also generally without a proper or sometimes any fire control system. Torpedoes and mines could also be carried, if necessary, most commonly on the raiders rather than the armed merchant cruisers, the other type of armed merchantman was relatively simply called the armed merchantman. And this could be of any size, but would generally carry a very minimal armament, perhaps a single three, four or five inch gun, and later on maybe some light anti-aircraft weapons. The guns would usually be served, depending on the nation and time period, by either a small naval party, in the case of the armed merchantman, or naval reserve officers, or in extreme circumstances, a corps of reservists or perhaps one or two regular Navy men would manage and train a largely civilian gun crew who may have been temporarily inducted into the Navy in question. Whereas for armed merchant cruisers or armed merchant raiders, crews were generally entirely naval, whether active or reservist. A number of navies, 
especially the British Admiralty, planned for these kinds of eventualities and would offer subsidies to commercial shipping companies on the condition that the ships that were built with the money that was being provided came with strengthened positions on their decks to allow easy mounting of guns, along with standing agreements with those shipping companies to surrender control of the vessels to the Navy in question if needed during time of war, along with a whole load of other particular sub-clauses. Despite the very wide variety of ship sizes and armaments that were possible under these paradigms, encounters between these kinds of ships and warships were generally extremely one-sided. The relatively light armament, normal lack of centralised or any fire control, and the complete lack of armour meant that the only factors in the merchant's favour might be surprise and sheer size as without the same levels of combustible and explosive material as aboard a warship, a smaller crew, so therefore fewer people to kill, and generally a relatively light load, and therefore quite buoyant, it could actually take a surprising amount of firepower to actually knock a merchant ship out of action and sink it, unless a fire happened to catch and spread. Exceptions, such as the duel between the Cormoran and HMAS Sydney, did occur, but normally even a well-handled destroyer could deal with an armed merchant vessel, and even the most valiant of armed merchant crews would often end up like those of the Raoul Pindy, Jervis Bay or Beaverford if they fought, or the Otranto if they were fast enough and lucky enough to make a run for it. But occasionally, these armed merchant vessels would run into others of their own kind. And then very strange, although often heroic, battles would commence. To consider this aspect of naval warfare, which is often forgotten, we will consider two actions. For the first, we'll be looking at a period near the start of the First World War. The location? The Atlantic Ocean near Trindade Island, off the southeastern coast of Brazil. Not Trinidad. On the 14th of September, the armed merchant cruiser Carmania, or Carmania was patrolling the area. Originally, she was a Cunard liner, but she'd been armed with eight single 4.7-inch guns at the start of World War I and dispatched on general patrol and guard duties in the Caribbean and South Atlantic, where, at the time, most of the Royal Navy ships that were regularly in the area had either moved further south, or were heading that way, in the lead-up to the Battle of Coronel and, subsequently, the Battle of the Falkland Islands. Her goal was to investigate Trindade Island that morning, which was a generally desolate lump of rock, but one that the British feared, correctly, as it happened to turn out, that might be used by German raiders and supply ships as a base of operations to raid the shipping lanes off the coast of Brazil. With its relatively heavy armament for an armed merchant cruiser, the Carmania on paper at least, actually now outgunned many actual German protected and light cruisers. The near 20,000 ton ship aimed to flush out any lurking vessels and then either capture or destroy them. Like many protected cruisers of the time, her armament was mostly distributed in wing mounts, reducing her effective broadside considerably compared to the on paper eight gun armament. As one of the earliest large ships that had been built with turbines, her 18 knot speed, whilst not enough to catch a modern cruiser, would easily overhaul most gunboats or merchantmen, which were the expected prey that she thought she might find. As she steamed in close, she noticed an odd sight. And laying in the shelter of the island, alongside two colliers, was... herself. Something was clearly amiss, and Carmania cleared for action. The faux Carmania was in fact the armed merchant raider SMS Cap Trafalgar, ironically named as it turned out, a German liner which had been in Argentina at the time war had broken out. Also in the area at the outbreak of war had been the small gunboat SMS Eber, but the liner was larger, faster, longer ranged, and could carry more provisions as well as being slightly less obviously a German warship and so both ships had sailed from their respected ports to Trindade, where the Cap Trafalgar was formally inducted into the Imperial German Navy, with a couple of 4.1-inch guns and six machine guns from the Eber being transferred, along with a portion of the crew. Further supplies and apparently half a dozen 37mm cannon were also brought up and installed. 
and the cosmetic third funnel, which had been in place mostly for her lines and appearance, was removed, leaving her looking like a two-funnel ship, which, with a small amount of additional work, would leave her looking very much like the Carmania. This was done in order to better blend in with British shipping. The particular choice of Carmania was due to a number of superficial similarities with that class of liner to begin with. Both ships were about the same width, the German ship was only fractionally shorter and a not slower, and now both of them only had two funnels. This wasn't quite as random as it might seem, and was in fact in accordance with pre-war plans. The stripped down and skeleton crewed Ebba would head back to Brazil for internment, a move that was designed in part to give the British the impression of a lessened threat in the area, and thus increase the chances of the Cap Trafalgar moving around undetected. Technically now called Auxiliary Cruiser B, Cap Trafalgar set out to find and raid British merchant shipping, and I think we'll stick with its original name. But several weeks later, she was back at Trindade Island, having remarkably failed to find anything to shoot at. And so she set about recoaling. And it was at this point, while she was alongside her colliers, that the real Carmania appeared over the horizon. It was immediately obvious that the two liners could not fight it out in the harbour. Both were high-sided, unprotected, and had about the same agility as an obese three-legged drunken elephant that had started running downhill and suddenly discovered gravity was not in fact its friend. Any fight in the confined harbour environment would effectively consist of both coming to a near halt at point-blank range and blasting each other into oblivion. Thus, both captains, completely independently, decided to steam away from the island to give themselves a bit of space to steam and manoeuvre, which might allow them to gain a decisive advantage over their opponent. The Cap Trafalgar took the opportunity to broadcast the situation for the benefit of German authorities and any other German ships that might happen to be in the area and willing to lend a hand. And then, almost as if a starting bell had been rung, both ships turned towards each other and opened the engagement. In theory, Carmania had by far the heavier broadside, but with the first few salvos falling short, the lighter weapons of the Cap Trafalgar also fired more rapidly, and in a fight where both sides were aiming largely by visual fall of shot, the rapid-fire weapons were more likely to score hits earlier due to giving the gun crews more points from which to adjust their aim. The unarmoured nature of both ships also meant that the effects of smaller shells were actually meaningful, right down to the 37mm cannons, and in the case of taking out the crew, the machine guns. The fight resembled less a modern naval conflict, more a bizarre but somewhat thematically appropriate reenactment of the Battle of Trafalgar, with runners bringing ammunition up to the guns from the holds, and the gun captains eyeing in their shots according to the role of the ship. As they closed, even the machine guns would come into action, with crew on both sides running duck and cover along the rails and through portholes and doorways of formerly first-class cabins as bullets ricocheted all around. Also like Trafalgar, the British ship was largely firing its heavy guns at the Germans' hull, whilst the Germans were using their few larger guns in a similar manner, but were hosing down the upper works of the ship with their lighter weapons. After a worryingly long amount of time spent blasting back and forth, both ships were looking rather the worse for wear. Although Carmania, at first glance, appeared to be in poorer shape, with multiple fires raging and a smashed-in bridge. She'd been hit dozens of times and was taking on water from a number of hits further down the hull. But just as it looked like the imitation Carmania would triumph over the real thing, the Cap Trafalgar dramatically heeled out of line, listed to port, and began deploying lifeboats. Extensive damage at and below the waterline had caused multiple compartments to start flooding, and the ship was actually going down very fast. One of the problems with operating a relatively minimal crew on such a large vessel was that getting all the bulkheads secured was difficult, and repairing or shoring up damaged ones was near impossible which wouldn't have been the case on a warship, and that's not counting for doors either left open by accident or reopened by ammunition parties running back and forth. 
Thus, a number of hits that would have impaired a warship were instead about to prove extremely rapidly fatal to the armed merchant raider. The colliers that Cap Trafalgar had been supplying were able to actually rescue most of the crew, although the ship's commanding officer, Captain Verth, was among the dead. Exactly how many died in the action is disputed, with estimates ranging from just over a dozen to several dozen, with additional confuse, confusion coming from some accounts attributing only deaths to those lost in action, whilst others attributing deaths to include those who drowned in the process of the ship's sinking. However, from an overall crew of just over 300, the casualty rate was relatively low, given the speed of the ship's capsizing. Casualty-wise, Carmania had actually come off somewhat better, with only nine dead, but quite a large number wounded, in significant part because the shrapnel fragments and fires caused by the 37mm and machine gun rounds had had rather negative effects on nearby crewmen. Damage-wise, though, Carmania was almost in as bad a state as Cap Trafalgar. The fires above, and a significant amount of flooding below, seemed to be competing for the right to send the ship to the bottom. And to cap it all off, another German armed merchant raider, the Kronprinz Wilhelm, hove into view, having heard Cap Trafalgar's transmissions. However, Carmania had also been broadcasting during the battle, and the new arrival had noticed both sets of transmissions, even if she couldn't decode the Carmania's ones. On balance, given the proximity of a number of actual warships in the area, albeit small ones, the captain of Kronprinz Wilhelm decided that since the crew of their fellow raider was in the process of being rescued, and Cap Trafalgar herself was gone, it wasn't worth trying to finish off Carmania, given that Kronprinz Wilhelm might in turn then be set upon by a warship and also sunk, making the battle a two-to-one in the British favour. This presumption actually saved Carmania, as the second German raider then turned away without engaging. Carmania herself was actually balanced on a knife edge, and so she ignored the colliers, instead heading south to try and find a British cruiser that was an actual fact making its way toward the engagement area, albeit that the ship was somewhat further away than Kronprinz Wilhelm's captain had actually assumed, as it wouldn't be until the following day that Carmania would finally meet up with a friendly ship, and then be escorted into the nearby port of Pernambuco for emergency repairs, with the remaining crew doing just enough to keep the ship afloat until aid could be offered. This engagement highlighted many of the issues these vessels had. Confrontation was hugely risky, with no armour, meaning that practically any weapon more advanced than a thrown rock was actually quite effective, and the reduced crews and sheer size of the ships meant that fire and flooding could spread very rapidly in a way that was exceptionally unlikely aboard an actual warship, with better subdivision and significantly more men on damage control. Additionally, Despite heading out into open water to fight, ostensibly for more manoeuvring room, the similar speeds and relative lack of agility on the part of both X-liners meant that the fight ran more along the lines of an old-style broadside battle than any particular action of manoeuvre. Finally, all of these issues had combined to result in a battle in which the only real victory was actually survival. Carmania was in no shape to continue operations and had only barely made it back to safety. However, in the end, the threat of Cap Trafalgar had been ended, and even had Carmania been lost, the damage to the German ship would likewise have forced it into port, and unlike the British, they didn't have friendly ports across the globe in which to take shelter. Further, the fact that Carmania was even there illustrated that even the mighty Royal Navy couldn't be everywhere at once with its regular warships, and thus, hazardous as they were, armed merchant cruisers still had some place in the lineup of modern naval warfare in the first half of the century. But we'd promised to look at two instances, so the second is a battle that took place in World War II, and shows that many of the issues that were reflected in Cap Trafalgar's sinking still existed despite advances in technology and design, as well as illustrating that often it was as much a matter of crew determination as it was technology in any particular engagement. It was September again, but this time it was the 27th of September 1942, and a newly completed Liberty ship, the SS Stephen Hopkins, 
was on the second leg of her maiden operational voyage. Again, ironically enough, the venue is the South Atlantic, albeit this time we're on the other side of the ocean. The Hopkins was making her way from Cape Town to Suriname, when she sailed into an area of extremely heavy fog. Nothing particularly unusual for the area. At just over 14,000 tons displacement and almost 450 foot long, the Liberty ship could carry a fair bit of cargo for the average merchant of the day, and so she'd had some protection installed. She was no armed merchant cruiser, but a 4-inch gun was present for use against surface submarines, and a couple of 37mm cannon and half a dozen machine guns for similar use, and also to provide a modicum of defence against hostile aircraft had also been installed. But then suddenly, just before 0900, through the fog, at a range of only a couple of miles, appeared a pair of unknown ships. These were the armed merchant raider Steer and her supply ship, the Tannenfels. The supply ship was by a fair margin the largest vessel present, over a thousand tons heavier than the Hopkins, twenty meters longer, and five knots faster. But she only carried a mixture of 37mm and 20mm cannon, plus some machine guns. For all her size and speed, she was still only a supply vessel. The main threat was actually the steer, which was broadly of a similar linear size to the Hopkins when it came to length and width, but displaced significantly less due to a somewhat shallower draft. She was still faster than the Hopkins, but only by about three knots. But where she really came into her own was her armament, which was considerable. Half a dozen 5.9 inch guns, a 75mm gun, a twin 37mm cannon mount, four 20mm cannon, two torpedo tubes, and a couple of float planes gave her a weapons loadout comparable to a fairly large destroyer or small cruiser, albeit less efficiently laid out. Like the Cormoran and other such raiders, she'd actually been specifically converted for the role in Germany, as opposed to being fitted out in a somewhat ad hoc, if, some, if planned manner, abroad like the Cap Trafalgar had been a couple of decades earlier, which, along with her naval crew, made her a considerably more deadly opponent, whilst the poor old Hopkins armament looked positively anemic compared to Carmania's battery. Preferring to save ammunition, and also mindful of the fact that despite its considerable advantages, the steer was still unarmoured and built to merchant spec, the German raider first ordered the Hopkins to heave to and prepare to receive boarders, and also obviously went to action stations. But the Hopkins refused, its captain having likewise ordered his crew to make ready, as he was just as suspicious of the two new arrivals as they were of him. And so, with the refusal to accept borders on record, shortly thereafter, the steer opened fire. The small military contingent aboard the Hopkins could only really hope to hit back with the four-inch gun, as even at a couple of miles range, everything smaller had basically no chance of actually connecting. But the steer's gunners were very well aware of that fact, raking the Liberty ship generally, but especially focusing some of their greater firepower on that lone artillery piece. The gun crew, for all their efforts, were swiftly cut down, as e without even a gun shield they were horribly vulnerable, even to splinters from near misses. But the Hopkins crew were determined not to go down without a fight, and volunteers made desperate sprints across the open deck to replace gun crew who fell one by one, trying to keep up the fire at their small but deadlier opponent. Hits were scored by both sides, and within a very short time the quick-firing guns on both ships had racked up an awful butcher's bill. Hopkins drifted away out of control with more than two-thirds of her crew dead, many of them having fallen manning the four-inch gun. Eighteen men would make it off the ship, as it sank barely an hour after the first shot had been fired, and a further three of those would prove too badly injured to survive much longer. But Steer was not in much better shape. Whilst its own casualties were remarkably light, with only two killed, the surprisingly accurate fire from Hopkins, which had been directed mainly at the steer's machinery, had left many holes in the hull and started a number of fires. Additionally, the engines were dying, water was coming in, and the rudder control systems somewhere deep in the ship were decorating a bulkhead. 
Captain Gerlach realised that Steer was not going anywhere fast, except downwards, and the small crew could not hope to fight the fires, the flooding, and try and repair the engines to provide power all at the same time. Whilst not addressing any one of these would doom them just as surely. Thus signalling the Tannenfels, which had stayed out of action, the crew evacuated about an hour after the valiant Hopkins had slipped beneath the waves. Forty minutes after that, before lunchtime, the fires reached something important and the steer detonated and sank moments later. Without a raider to supply, the Tannenfels, with the survivors aboard, would make a careful journey home over the following weeks. The Hopkins commanding officer, Captain Paul Buck, had been killed in action and gone down with his ship. The 18 survivors were whittled down to 15, as mentioned earlier, and would sail the South Atlantic for over a month before fetching up on the Brazilian coast. A number of medals would be awarded for the action on the Allied side, but such was the ferocity of the fight that all major awards were made posthumously. As we can see, despite the disparity of firepower, the determination of the crew on the Hopkins allowed them to gain what was effectively a mutual kill, but at the same time, the equipment had also allowed for it. Now, granted, the combatants were somewhat smaller than Carmania and not Carmania, but in the case of Steer and Hopkins, they also possessed quick-firing guns capable of considerably greater rates of fire and accuracy than the old guns that had been present in the World War I engagement, despite both sets of shipping having been equipped with guns that were not exactly top of the line for the period. As a result, despite the best efforts of the steer, the Liberty ship was able to inflict fatal damage in short order. Whilst merchant ships, and to a certain extent merchant raiders, would continue to persist in bearing arms during World War II, the rapid increases in the lethality that weapons possessed meant that the days of the armed merchant of any flavour, at least as far as taking on other ships was concerned, were significantly numbered. With the practicality of the armed merchant ship rapidly disappearing, and the dominance of major navies over the sea lanes becoming ever greater with advances in airborne and radar technology, merchantmen from the 1950s onwards would tend to forego armament, with international legislation also coming in that regulated and in many cases would actually forbid it. Thus marking the end of a history that stretches back almost as far as the first time that someone who had contrived to take their projectile launching device with them to sea decided that they were going to stick it on their grain ship, back when the trireme was the height of naval technology. So that's a quick look at a couple of encounters between various armed merchantmen of different flavours during the two world wars, which hopefully gives you some idea of that little theatre of operations, which as I said at the beginning of the video is not particularly well known, but also perhaps gives some insights as to why this kind of confrontation was very much something of a dying breed, and why these things don't tend to occur these days. Well, that and the fact we fortunately haven't had another major global conflict since. And for those of you who are curious about the confrontations that were mentioned near the top of the video between armed merchant ships and actual warships, yes, they will be coming, just not this time. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.